يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان ومن يتبع خطوات الشيطان فانه يامر بالفحشاء والمنكر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين Firstly to you brothers and sisters who are listening, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today's uh, topic is going to be about something which, um, which affects all of us. And I think a lot of us have questions regarding this. And sometimes we are puzzled about this. And we kind of sometimes wonder what is going on. Because if you look at the, the situation of the ummah today, it's not getting any better from compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's, you know, it's always up and down. And there's a lot going on. Now, before I get into any of that, the primary thing is to understand that most Muslims see the world as, I mean, when I say most Muslims, I mean, most of those who haven't really studied the Quran properly, who haven't really studied the Sunnah properly, they tend to see the, the tend to see the world in a black and white uh, through a black and white lens, which means that they end up saying, you know, there's there's Iman or the be believers or belief in believers, and they say there's Kufr and what they might say Kafirs or the disbelievers or disbelief. And it's almost like um, there's, a, there's a group here that wants to always be attacking the believers and the believers have to try their best to defend themselves and, you know, um, move themselves in a positive way. And it's almost always like this black and white world. And it doesn't do justice because even Allah Azawajal never made a black and white world. Even though there are references in the Quran that may appear to be black and white, the Quran is not black and white. If you study the Quran properly, you, you take all the, what you need to do is you can't look at one reference of kufr, one reference of disbelief. You can't look at one reference of iman or belief. You cannot look at one reference where Allah has mentioned the two together and say, well, that's it, see, you know, the two have to depart and so on. Yes, it's true. The two are different. Iman is different from kufr. And so, so basically belief is different from disbelief. That is very clear. And Allah has said there's a very clear distinction between the two. Fine. And if you look in the Quran, you will find, for example, look in Surah Kafirun. The Surah is called the disbelievers right at the end of the Qur'an uh, and it says قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ O you who disbelieve لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ I will not worship the things that you worship وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ You will not worship what I worship وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدُ مَا أَعْبُدُ I will never worship what you're worshipping وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ You will not worship what I worship لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَالْيَدِينَ You have your religion, I have mine Now when you look at this, it really looks like a black and white situation, like divide you know, there's your part and there's our part. But where the great misunderstanding comes in most of these cases is that people haven't really looked at the background of why this particular verse came. If you ever study the Quran and if you don't look at the, the background and put everything into context, then you make, you're going to make a serious mistake. And a lot of Muslims, unfortunately, have made this serious mistake. So um, what they won't do is they won't actually you know, go deep in comparing the different verses and looking at the different contexts because there is no text without context. This is a very clear principle. There is no text without context. So even in your family household, somebody said something, you know, let's say you came home and somebody you know, got, said something rude to somebody else. Something rude, whatever it was. It was something rude and you came home and you thought, what? My brother said something rude to my, you know, sister-in-law. What? I mean, if you go straight away to your brother and say, how dare you? You're making a mistake straight away because, yes, your brother might have been rude, but you haven't. Okay, let's say you, you should investigate. We all know that you should investigate. Fine. But the most important thing is even if you know your brother was rude, you need to now ask why. What was the case? Why was he rude to the sister-in-law and then you get a better picture now if he was rude because of something silly like she 
you know, she was in the house and he was just trying to watch what he wanted to on TV or something and she wanted to watch what she wanted and then it turned into an argument. That was really silly, right? But if it turns out that there was a major incident where she left the, you know, door open and a stranger um, was about, a stranger actually came inside and he was about to cause harm, serious harm to either the house or the family and then he was rude to her you know, it changes, right? Yeah. It changes, the whole context changes now because she's now left the door open and almost, a, you know, kid could have been kidnapped from the, from the house. You know, all sorts of things could have happened because a stranger came in, he found the door open. Now, I'm not saying he should have been rude, it just doesn't justify it, but you can understand that there's a difference to the first scenario where they're fighting over the remote control or something which is silly and then he was rude to her that's that's not appropriate but when you come to the quran every single time when allah has given us a text there's a context and what that means is al kafirun was revealed at a time when they when the disbelievers came to make a proposal to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so they had tried to stop him in his mission, he wouldn't. So their proposal was this. They said, okay, since you're not going to stop, and many incidents had, had, had happened, and even the whole of the social, you know, they, they, they had so many dilemmas, so they put a proposal. They said, okay, because don't forget, the mushrikeen or the, or the disbelievers or the polytheists in the Prophet's time, they believed in Allah as well. You've got to understand this. They believed in Allah, but they believed in 360 additional gods. And the Prophet ﷺ was saying, no, only one God, that is Allah. No other gods, nothing exists. So they came up with a proposal. It was a clever proposal. They said, okay, let's do this. Oh Muhammad, you and us will be equal. Okay, we will join you in your worship, in just worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. All of us, just Allah, that's it. All of us, trust us, we'll do this. You and us together, yeah, we'll just worship Allah for one day. And the next day, you join us and you worship the 360 plus Allah. And the next day, we only will worship Allah alone with you, your God only. And the next day you worship all our gods plus Allah. And that's when the surah was revealed. Qul ya kafirun or you disbelieve. La a'budu ma ta'budu. I will never worship what you worship. Like if you ever bring this proposal to me to try and get me to worship your gods, it won't happen. Wala antum abidun. You really in your heart you cannot worship my God alone because when you worship my God alone, you have to abandon all your gods. So how is it ever possible that you will even compromise on that one day when you worship in just Allah alone? I know you believe in Allah, but how will you actually do that when in your hearts you still love all the 360, you believe in the 360, you believe they have powers, you believe they are real gods, when worshiping Allah means you have to give up all other gods. And then that's when in the end of the verse it says, Lakum deenukum wal yadeen. You know, your, this is your way of worship, your religion. And this is my religion. My religion says you have to give up all your gods and worship only one Allah. Your religion says that you can worship Allah on one day and you can worship many gods on another day. Well, I'm sorry, that's your religion. This is my religion. Do you guys understand that now? So this surah was never meant to give you an idea that there's a black and white, that's kufr, kufar, disbelievers and there's email and that's it. Allah, look what, akhi, look what he says in the Quran. Lakum deenukum wal yadeen. You got your religion, we got ours. And what they then do is they, they pull out verses from Quran. And don't get me wrong, every verse they pull out, okay? It's got a, when you read it, you almost feel like there's, there's a, a black and white, you know, clear thing to, to, to understand that. So let me give you a, let me give you a verse. Well, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says very clearly, Ya ayyu al amanu, O you who believe. So this is now addressing us. Ya ayyu al amanu, it says, La... Allah says, لا تتخذ اليهود والنصارى أولياء Allah says here, this is surah number 5, ayah number 51 Allah says, يا أيها الذين أمنوا Oh you believe, don't take the Jewish or the Jewish people and the Christian people أولياء as your, as your close allies 
Ba'aduhum awliya ba'ad. Some of them are allies of others. Wa man yatawallahum minkum fa innahum minhum. So whosoever will make them close allies from amongst you, then you really of them. Inna Allah la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimin. Allah will not guide those people who are oppressors. Now when you look at this verse, it's very clear. Very clear. Don't make them your close allies. Now, you've got to understand, subhanAllah al-Azim, that this verse also has a context. And this verse needs to be understood with many other verses around. Because what Allah is saying is that, you know, from the apparent meaning of this verse is that you don't make any, you know, close alliances with them. However, if you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sirah, you will find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he came to Medina, he made a, a pact where he had a constitution made, an agreement between himself and the Jewish people of Medina so that they would form together a ruling party that would rule over the whole of Medina but at the head of that was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and if the Jews had a problem they would you know they would do something they would judge by the Torah if the Muslims had a problem they would judge by the Quran and this was a pact that stayed together as a constitution for some time until the very people who signed that with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they broke their side of the agreement otherwise Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had his agreements there so, so part of this agreement was that if the Muslims were being attacked from outside then the Jewish people would help if the Jewish people were attacked from outside the Muslims would help Okay, this was very clear in the agreement and a Muslim would never kill a Jew, a Jew would never kill a Muslim and if a Muslim ever did that then he should you know, be killed in return of that, if a Jew ever did that he should be killed in return of that. There were many laws that were placed, about 51 different articles to this constitution that Rasulullah has made. Now you've got to take that in consideration with this and you've also got to take consideration for example at the time of war because what normally happens is people say, well, that's it. There's a war going on. That's it. No more negotiation. No more sort of listening. But you look in the Quran. Though the Quran has said, yes, they may reveal, you know, they, they may want, like sometimes the Quran does say, they, they want to hear, when they hear ill news of you, it makes them happy. It says that. Not all of them, but some of them. In, you know, if, if you have um, good news, Tasu'uhum, it, it hurts them. Wa in tafrahu, if you're happy, right, it will hurt them. But if you're, if you're afflicted, then they will be happy. Okay, it says things like that, fine. But then you get a verse like this, Surah Anfal, Surah number 8, ayah number 61. Allah says, Wa in janahu salmi fajnah laha. If in the midst of a war, we're talking about this, is, this ayah is, if you look all around it, it's talking about battle and a war. If in the middle of a war, they come to you with a proposal of a treaty and they want to just stop fighting and they want you know, a bit of a truce or a treaty, Allah says, Fajnah laha. Agree to it. Agree to the treaty. Wa tawakkal ala Allah and depend on Allah. Inna Allah, inna hu huwa sami'ul alim. He is surely the one who listens to everything and the one who knows everything. Now, what this is saying is another side to the first ayah that I said to you from Surah Ma'idah, Surah number 5. And if you don't take both of them in context, you will not be able to understand the Qur'an properly. You can't take just one ayah presented in black and white way and say, well, this is what Allah is telling us to do. And for example, if you look in the Qur'an, you will find that Allah Azza wa Jal has said in many different situations how different people will come to you and try and strike a deal with you to not fight with you. And Allah says, some of them Allah says agree and some of them Allah says don't agree. If you want to find all of this later on, I'm not going to go into the details of this, it's quite long. Look in Surah number 4 and from ayah number 90, 91, 90... Yeah, and 90 and 91. Just look at that. You will find a lot of things Allah says about the time of war. Some people Allah said, okay, fine, you make an agreement. Some people Allah said, don't do that because they will, they will come back and they'll do something worse next time. Now, again, what I'm trying to give you is I'm trying to give you a flavor of different things. Why each of these verses were revealed in a different context. And when we, when we now see what happens is most Muslims, 
they will start, you know, if you listen to social media, if you listen to people blogging, if you listen to you know, people writing about what's going on in the world, most of the times you kind of get this black and white, oh my God, look what they did, they're all together, they're all trying to do the same thing. Now, subhanallah al Allah says in the Holy Quran, He said, Laysu sawa'a, when He was discussing the Jews and the Christians, though He said in that other verse, I just quoted you in Surah Ma'idah, He said, don't make any close allies, I mean, you're not supposed to make any close allies, fine. You know, that's something where if you make someone your close ally, it means that you're going to be chummy chummy with them in everything. Allah saying, no, well, you've got to have a bif- difference of a different mark because you've got to, okay, you, if you want to make a truce or a treaty or get on or negotiations, fine. But end of the day, you've got to understand that the believers must be the closest to you. That's, that's, that's what, what the Quran is trying to say. However, there's another part. And that part is that the, the, the believers need to understand that you've got this situation and it's going to carry on with, with the Muslims being on, on one side and the non-Muslims and so on. Allah Azza in discussing all of this and discussing the Ahlul Kitab and the people of the book and the Jews and the Christians, in the midst of that Allah says in Surah number 3, Ayah number 113, He says, Laysu sawa'a the people of the book, the Jews and Christians are not all the same. They're not the same. They're not all equal. There are many different shades amongst them. And the Quran, if you study it, subhanAllah, you see the many shades Allah talks about. So for example, in this verse, Surah number 3, 113, Allah says, مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ أُمَّةٌ قَائِمَةٌ يَتْلُونَ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ آنَا اللَّيْلِ وَهُمْ يَسْجُدُونَ okay? Some are different to others, you know, in terms of the worship, fine. But then Allah Azza wa Jal has very established, you know, He's established that even when certain Muslims got ripped off. Okay, so what happened is this, this is the context of this. Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, gave, them the, gave us the religion. Muslims converted or they, they basically became Muslims in, in Medina Munawwara. They weren't Muslims before, they were following, you know, they were close to the Jewish religion before. And some of these people got totally ripped off. How? Because when, when they were non-Muslims, the Jewish people had trade going on with them. And they said to them, look, you know, we've got this barter, we've got this trade going on and so on. And, you know, I, I owe you this. I'm going to give you this. So they're saying to this person who's about to become Muslim, they don't know he's going to become Muslim. They're saying that, look, the Jewish person says, I owe you this because you, you gave me this. I'm going to pay you back. Fine. Suddenly, this person now becomes a Muslim. And he goes back to the Jewish person. This is not all the Jews. This is just particular Jews in that society. So he went back and he said, give me my money or what you owe me. And he said, I don't have to give it to you. He said, why? He said, because you've changed your religion. It's in my Torah or it's in one of my scriptures that if you change your religion, then all you know, transactions are nullified. I don't have to do anything with you. Now that was actually a lie, it was a fabrication. Allah revealed that in the Quran. Nowhere in the Torah Allah revealed that. But listen to this. Look how Allah Azza wa Jal now talks about the Jewish people in the Quran. This is Allah being balanced. Okay, and if you don't take all of the verses, you'll end up with a black and white one. Now listen to this. Allah says, Surah number three, ayah number seventy-five. Min ahli kitab from the people of the book, meaning some Jewish people. Some Christians. Manin ta'man hu biqintarin you addihi ilayk. If you left with him, if you left with this Jewish person, a whole heap of gold, a whole heap of gold, you said, please look after this for me. You addihi ilayk, he will give you the whole of the whole of the, you know, the, the, the heap of gold, he will give it back to you out of trust. This Jewish person will never betray you in his dealing with you. Allah said that first. Look how careful Allah is. He says that first. Some Jewish people, they will give you even a heap of gold. He won't take a penny. He won't even take a bit of gold. You know, some people, you know, sometimes you go to the gold shop, yeah? I don't know if you know this, yeah? You better weigh your own gold before you give it to the gold shop to re- reshape it. You know that trick, don't you? You know when you give gold to the, the goldsmith, you better wait at home because sometimes the scales are dodgy. Because when you take it to the scales, it says something different. Okay, a few ounces sort of less already when he weighs it. So you better wait home 
then you take it to the gold shop and then they wait there, find, see if it's the same. If it's not the same, you better question it. But when you give it to them to try and work on the gold and change the shape of it and so on to a different design, sometimes they give it back to you and they've taken a bit of gold from it. A few ounces, you won't even realize, okay? And it does matter, it's a lot of money. Right? And if they do that to all the customers, they will, they, will, you know, they will be making a lot of money out of this, which is really ripping you off, but you might not even realize what, what is happening. Now, the, the, the point is, you, you've given a whole heap of gold to a Jewish person, Allah first says, he'll give it back to you. You can trust him. And then Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ But there are certain Jewish people, and there are certain Christians, in who bi dinar, if you give them one single gold dinar to look after. You give them one, forget a heap of gold coins, no, one. La you addihi ilayka illa ma dumta alayhi qaima. He will never return it back to you unless you pestered him and you were on his back all the time. To get that one gold dinar of him, he won't give it back to you. So if you look at the Qur'an, subhanAllah, it's given both sides. It said, look, some of them, you can trust them. Some of them, you can't trust them. And if you think this is all about non-Muslims being dis discussed here, no, I'm sorry. This is the big point I'm trying to make to you in this talk, which is when Allah discussed the Muslims, He was also fair in the Qur'an. You will not find the Qur'an discussing all about Muslims in a positive way, no. The Qur'an will discuss about the close believers, the good believers in a positive way, yes. The Qur'an will recommend the believers become better in their iman, in their faith, and their actions, yes. The Qur'an will also talk about certain believers who've fallen short. It's in different parts of the Qur'an. And the Qur'an will also talk about certain people who showed they were leading Muslim lives, but they had very bad traits inside them. They used to lie and cheat, which we know as munafiqs or the hypocrites. Now, to a lot of Muslims and even non-Muslims studying the Quran, they kind of take this as, you know, well, these are the munafiqs, the hypocrites, and these are the Muslims, and, you know, they're different people. Not always. The munafiq or the hypocrite that does not believe from his heart but he believes from his tongue. So imagine somebody completely, you know, they don't have any faith in Islam, and on the, on the front of it, like, ah, salamu alaykum, ah, salamu alaykum, ah, salamu alaykum. You know, they're praying with us, they're saying salam, but he's a spy, or he's there to cause us danger, or he's, you know, you get these reporters come now and again, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? Channel 4 guy, you know what I'm saying? Or some other guy, some, some fake shake, right? comes and stays with us for one year, two years, MashaAllah, brother reverted, or he's with us, big beard, he's with the Salah every day, he's Salam and coffee shops and with the Muslims and how are you and what's going on for one or two years. And all along what he's doing is, he's only here to report back. So all he's doing is he's taking the information every day, typing it away, making his little article, his book, his report, his secret camera, recording the Muslims. Ah, God, yeah. That's going on inside, yeah? On the face of his like, oh, okay, I'm sorry for you. Oh, that's what, oh. And then inside, ah, God, yeah. Caught you on camera. You wait till he comes on Channel 4. So this is a true munafiq. This is a real munafiq. That's not a Muslim. That's clear, from the Qur'an as well, it's clear. That this person is only there just for the show of it, or just for a short while, or just because, you see, some people come along and they stay with Muslims for a while for, for their own gains, for their own needs. They, they're only here for their own self. They're seeing that the Muslims are probably getting something, well, I better be there to get it as well, right? I don't know if you, if you ever, have you ever seen that? No? Well, I'm going to give you a typical example, yeah? <laughs> it's a funny one, man. This doesn't happen in this country, it happens in the third world countries. And I, sometimes I, I, I go like this, I go, oh my God, oh my God. I think, oh my God, right? You know, people don't die for this, you don't, like, for example, yeah? For Tarawih, have you seen that many people, like, die to go to Tarawih? Like, like no, no, I want to get there first, I want to get there first. Like, you know, let me, let me go to the front line first. Have you ever seen that many people die for Tarawih? No. 
Okay, no, straight up. Have you ever seen people die to like, go to Juma and wait there? Even if it takes to wait there for three hours, four hours. I want to get to that part where the khutbah is said, I want to feel elated. You don't, you don't get that. Okay, people are not so forward in that. Okay, Eid Salah, on the day of Eid, people do come for Eid. And again, people are just there for the Eid. It's like, man, you know, when's the guy going to finish? And sometimes they can't even wait for the khutbah. Is that right or not? The Imam said, Salam, you're supposed to stand, sit for the khutbah. They can't even wait for that. They're, they've gone. Now the same people, subhanallah, when the sacrifice of the animals are being done, this is in a third world country, yeah? They're like... They're like ants, they're like, they're like people who are waiting for a football match, a massive football match to go on, right? They're all over, they're everywhere, they're watching you, you've, you've, you've slaughtered the animal and a few animals, they're watching that piece, the big piece, that piece. And then, you know, you've, and I mean, okay, some of them are poor, fine, but you've got to be fair, right? You've got to be fair. You weren't dying for Tarawih, you weren't dying for Juma. you just about came for Eid Salah, the same people who, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Gone, they're, they're nowhere to be seen. Fajr Isha, forget it. Forget it, brother. Even Zohar daylight, he's got the masjid there, he won't even go there. But you know the day of sacrifice? I was there, I did it myself. And I saw this. It's kind of chaotic, it's crazy. So you sacrificed and then, you know, you've got to now, now get the skin off, okay? Get the whole skin off and then you've got to now cut the, cut the whole, you know, animal into pieces, right? Suddenly someone says, Hey! Hey, now I'll say in Bengali, you probably understand. Like who take, who's, who's run off with the head? Some guy in the midst of all the chaos has grabbed the head and gone off with it. Now, you're sitting, where's the, where's the head gone? Hey, where, you know, you're, you've got blood over your hands. You're, you're trying to sort the thing out. The people's, hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. And then you realize that a second one gone. They go, yeah, I'm gonna be like, stop, stay back, stay back, stay back, stay back, right? You know what are you doing? Right? Okay, fine. So you're trying to get it to pieces, this, that, right? Now you're trying to put it into piles so that it's fair and square for everyone, right? If, honestly, you take your eyes off the one minute, oh, no, forget a minute, man. You take it off there for a few seconds, gone. Gone. I mean, literally gone. There's a pile of meat there, gone. <laughs> you like, you think, yeah, Allah. I mean, another thing, right, I'll give you, you, you know, this is, this is, you think, subhanAllah, what is this? Well, this is when Muslims are not being proper Muslims and they've got a, they've got a bit of hypocrisy inside them where they, they're there for the gain of it. They're not there for the sacrifice, the, the you know, because the, the Quran says, This is Surah Hajj, I think it's around ayah number 37, Allah says, look, the meat won't reach Allah, the blood won't reach Allah, but the, the God consciousness, the God fearing heart you've got, that will reach Allah. Allah will watch how fearful you are. Allah will watch how aware you are of Him. Allah says the whole sacrifice, look, that's for you, fine. But I'm going to watch how your hearts are really, you know, fearing me and being conscious of me. That's what Allah wants to look at. And these guys, are they there for that? Nah, they're for their meat, bruv. They want their meat. You know what I'm saying? They want their barbecue later on and the curries and whatever else they can do. And sometimes a whole leg goes missing. You're like, whoa, I just cut three legs. Where's the fourth one gone? That cow didn't have three legs, bro. <laughs> Where's the fourth one gone? And people are standing around. They know probably who took it, but no one's going to say anything. All right? No one's going to say anything because they want to take a piece as well if they can, right? Before it's distributed. Now, forget that. You know, sometimes, you know, you think, lie, lie, lie. We've... You know, I've seen this, it, it, it happens, okay, the, you know when the monsoon season comes and the, and the rain comes really heavy, heavy down. What, where, where would people be when the rain is coming really heavy down? Are you going to be out in the rain or are you going to be inside the building? Where are you going to be? Inside. inside the building, that's good. Most decent people are inside the building, except for a few. Who are out there in the monsoon rain, they're loving it. You know why? Because today is stealing time. They go, they know these mangoes, the mangoes are going to drop like pop, 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 pop from the trees. They know because of the months, because of the rain, it's hitting really hard. The winds are blowing, so it's going to drop any moment. And as they drop, these guys are in people's gardens. People's gardens are picking them up. Quick, quick! Because no one wants to come out. Even if you want to come out, you can't even see them because of the amount of rain. Okay? And even if you do see them, by the time you've got there, they've gone. They've taken a whole load of mangoes and then... 
you know, yesterday there was loads of mangoes that you were wishing, oh, I'm going to have those mangoes one day. They're my mangoes, yeah. And today you're like, huh? Huh? Which jinns like ate all those mangoes, man? What happened? And you know, see, these people are there for, for the sake of it. Now, look, my point here is that when Allah discusses the Muslims, he, He's fair again. And He will talk about the close believers, the good believers, the weak believers. Then He'll talk about the hypocrites like these ones, after this, after that, stealing, cheating, whatever. He'll talk, I mean, they, their now name is not believers. But Allah gives them a name of munafiq, which is that they've got this problem inside them of hypocrisy. And then the real munafiq, like the guy I said to you, these are at the bottom, okay? So there's two types of munafiqs. There's one that, that's, that's got bad traits in him. He steals, he lies, he cheats, he swears and so on. That's one, which is kind of still, they can have belief in their heart. Look, this one can have belief in the heart, but it very heavily fails in the, in, in, the, in the actions that they do. And lower than that are the real munafiqs, the ones that never believe from the heart and always are trying to make it look like they're, they're kind of fine, but inside they've got not a percent of iman inside the heart. Those are the real munafiqs. Allah discusses all of them. Now, the thing is, when most Muslims study the Quran, they kind of look at the, the good believers and the really, you know, close believers and they judge all believers by that. And then they're looking at all these ayats about kufr and disbelief and so on and they say, ah, look how bad, look how bad, look how bad and so on. Without realizing that what Allah has done is Allah has also said to us as the believers, reflect on yourselves. Don't be like those munafiqs. Don't be like the hypocrites. And don't be, you know, whenever Allah discusses the, the disbelievers, Allah's trying to say two things. One is, to the disbelievers, what you're doing is bad. But also He's trying to tell us, don't become like the disbelievers. Now, let's step back a bit. When you now study the Quran, you've got non-Muslims and disbelievers that are decent, like the one I just mentioned now, you give him a heap of gold, he'll return it back to you. He's not there to fight you. He's not there to cause problems for you. He's a trusted non-Muslim. This is from the Quran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 75. Clear there. But in the same Ayah, Allah talks about those non-Muslims that cannot be trusted. So you've got two categories. About the Jews and the Christians, the same thing. Allah says, they're not all the same. About the Muslims, Allah says, they're not all the same. Because there are good Muslims, there are weak Muslims, there are very good Muslims, there are seriously weak Muslims who are tainted with the name of munafiqs and hypocrites. Now when you look at the Quran, you've got to understand that there are further, several further divisions. So what happens normally is this, let me tell you in our real world. In our real world, People think, oh my God, the West, the West, the West. And they almost kind of make it feel like the whole of the West is there to do this, to do that, to do that, to do that. No, well, stop, stop for a minute. Yes, there are people amongst the people living in the West who have got a very bad agenda. But there are people amongst the people in the West who are living in the West, who are originally from the West, who've got a very good agenda who have got very good hearts and they've got very good agenda, uh, agendas. There are people living in the West because of whom we have benefited a lot in terms of how we are in these countries, how we live and so on. But then again, there are people who are living amongst us in the West whose ideology is to make life difficult for Muslims. You get all sorts. And it's not a thing about, well, they're disbelievers, they're going to have this bad thing, rotten thing about, the, about them. No. It's about us being fair. And when we look at the Quran, we will find that problems lie in all quarters of people and good people are in every community of people. Do you guys, do you guys understand that? If you want to really be fair, you have to be fair like this. So for example, even if you look at any political situation in any country, you won't find 100% all the people in that country all agreeing on, on that one thing. You won't find that. And you have to differentiate between the people who are in power and the people who are not in power because the Qur'an does that. 
Subhanallah al azim honesty, if you look in the Quran, the Quran will do that. It will talk about those who are in power and who've got the agenda and who's trying to do something to you and those who are not in power. And even those who are in power, Allah says they're not all bad. If you look at Surah number 40, Ayah number 28, Allah talks about one of the worst, one of the worst criminal governments on this earth, which was the government of Fir'aun. Pharaoh. And in the midst of that, Allah says, وَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مِّنْ آلِ فرعون. There was a man who was amongst the family of Fir'aun, amongst his counselors, amongst his close ones, but he was hiding his iman. يَكْتُمُ إِمَانَ He was hiding his iman. Yet he was telling Fir'aun and his men, look, guys, are you serious? You want to go after Musa like this? Are you serious? You want to kill a man who's just saying, my Lord is Allah? Look guys, if he's telling you a lie, then his lie will befall him. But you know what? If Musa is telling the truth, then part of what he's promising will befall all of you. Do you realize that? If he's telling the truth that there's going to be destruction coming along if you don't believe in his message, then part of it will come and afflict you. You've got to do the maths properly. Now look, subhanallah, a man who's outwardly kafir, inwardly believer, so outwardly is disbeliever, inwardly his believer, discussed in the Quran amongst one of the worst regimes in the history of mankind, which was Fir'aun's you know, regime. Now, why the Quran has told us this is because you've got to be able to differentiate. And if you look in the Quran, you'll find subhanallah, you'll find um, Fir'aun, who was one of the worst, but his wife is a believer. And, and in our world, would we ever think like, you know, that leader, oh, he's bad. Oh, yeah, he's, they're all bad. His whole family's bad and his whole clan's bad. No, no, hang on a minute. The Quran's told us to be fair with people. There are, I'm telling you, like, for example, even if you look at, you know, Tony Blair's own family members, some of them are very different, very different to him. I'm telling you from historical records of his own family members, some of them are very different to, to him his policies and what he's done. Okay? Now, all I'm trying to say to you is we've got to have this mind that we cannot treat this as all black and white. And, the cl and you know one phrase that gets used again and again, which throws a lot of our youth into trouble, which is they can't differentiate between this. Because if you give all these verses in one light, most of our youth will be you know, affected by this and say, yeah, you know, it's true. The Quran says, don't make them your allies. Quran says, you got your religion, I've got mine. Yeah. The Quran says, look, Akhi, the Quran says, they'll never return your money back to you. The Quran says, this. if you give those parts of the verses without making it balance, they will fall into a trap, which is what? I mean, the phrase that's used again and again. Now, this is a true phrase that was made up by the scholars of Islam. And you've got to understand the time it was made as well. And you've got to understand the context of where all of this comes from. They use the term al-wala wal-bara. Okay, you must have heard this phrase somewhere. And if you haven't, then listen to it now. This is beginning of Surah Tawbah, beginning of Surah number 9. The concept of wala wal-bara, which means your alliances, your alliances, people who you make close to yourself and people who you distant yourself from and say you're, you're going to stay away from. Alwala means people you keep close to yourself, alliances. And bara means you say, I, I'm acquitted of you. I'm distant from you. I've got nothing to do with you. So this again, black and white world. Now these verses that in the beginning of Surah Toba, where it talks about bara'atum min Allahi wa rasul, it begins by saying a declaration that, that Allah and his messenger are acquitted from what does Allah say? He says, Ahatum min al mushikin from the, 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 the agreement that you made with the polytheists. Now, what is Allah talking about? What Allah is talking about here is right near the end of the Prophet's time, just four years before he passes away, he's 59 years old. Muslims make a treaty called known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah where they say we're not going to fight for 10 years. And they make a treaty with the polytheists, with the mushriks, with the people who have always persecuted them. And they've tried to kill them, they've tried to kill them, fine. They say, look, no more fight, we'll have a truce right now. And they make this agreement. Okay? The agreement's supposed to last for 10 years. Within two years, after two years, the polytheists were the very people who broke the agreement because they started to fight with the allies of the Muslims.
They fought with one of the allies of the Muslims. And Allah's messenger was told by Allah that, look, the agreement is over now. Because they broke the agreement. If it said, if you ever attack our allies or if we attack your allies, this whole agreement is finished. Okay, that was part of the agreement. Since the polytheists in Mecca did that first, Rasulullah said, we'll march on to Mecca and we'll take Mecca over. And this is when this verse came down. Because the polytheists were saying, hey, hang on a minute. We've got this agreement. Our agreement says, we're allies. As in, we're not going to fight with one another. We're going to respect one another. How can you come and march into Mecca in our land and just take over this, this city? And Allah revealed this verse. Bara'atun min Allahi wa rasulihi ila alladhina ahadtun min al mushikeen Allah is acquitting himself from the agreement you made two years ago with the polytheists. Why? Allah's messenger acquitting themselves. Why? Because it's nullified. You broke the priest treaty. Now it doesn't exist anymore. Therefore, there's going to be a takeover. Now, if you listen to the beginning verses of this, this surah, you will find that there are very, almost you can say, a very harsh attitude towards the non-believers. And a lot of Muslims look at this and they say, well, you know what? These were some of the final verses and this is how we should treat all non-believers on La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. That's not what Allah meant. That's not what Allah's messenger meant. Because these verses again are a text in a context. There is no text without context. The very same people who are polytheists, for a long time Allah Azza wa had many different rules for them. And what Allah is telling us is you've got to decide which of these verses you will put into practice because of the situation you're in. You can't always take these verses in Surah, Bar- Bara- Surah Tawbah and say, that's it. We're, we're declaring a distance from all the people who are not believers. You can't do that because this it has got its own context. It's specific to a certain incident, which if you ever find yourselves in the same incident, the same things may apply. Do, do you all understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Guys, do you understand that? What's happened today, guys, is we've got a lot of our youngsters who get pulled into you know, some of these wars going across the world through the internet, there are many shuyukhs, there are many um, scholars who will quote these verses and they will say, look what Allah says. I mean, if you look at Surah Tawbah, ayah number five, it says, فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَتُمْ Kill the polytheists wherever you find them. And it, it says you, you grab hold of them, you besiege them, you, you ambush them from every side. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ these are, these are verses that are very specific to a context. Because these verses are talking about these very polytheists who saw the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ for 20 years and they still didn't believe. And Allah said to them, look, Allah didn't say, look, just go and do, you know, kill them or do anything. No, Allah said, announce, O Muhammad, وسلم, announce in front of the Kaaba that the polytheists now, after seeing 20 years, 20 years of your miracles and the Quran, and they have no excuse not to believe in this because they're Arabs, they understand the Quran, they've seen miracle after miracle from you, O Prophet, they've got no excuse not to believe. Tell them they've got four months. In those four months, if they convert, to Islam, fine. If not, allow them in the four months to pick up whatever belongings they've got and go wherever they want, give them amnesty. That's what the Quran is saying. But then if you find them after that, then this, this, this verse that I've just said, quoted to you, applies. It's a very specific context. What's happened is these scholars on the internet and there's books out there and there's our youngsters, some of them who are being brainwashed, are given these verses and they're told this is how you're supposed to deal with the black and white world. We're believers, the non-believers. Look what Allah says, this is what you do. It's wala wal bara, we're together, we're separate from them. We've got to do, you know, we've got to apply this verse always to them in every single time, every single place. La ilaha illallah, that is not what Allah Azza wa Jal said. And there are many non-Muslims who've also given Islam a bad name on the internet and social media and even on the blogs and so on because they've misunderstood these verses as well because they think that these, these, verses, these are verses that are all equal to all the verses of the Qur'an, no. 
The Quran was revealed in over 23 years and it's got many different verses of many different contexts. Okay. Now I want to put one more thing to the equation which I want this message to go out and I want people to wake up to this which is that part I said to you about the Muslims and you know, the, you know Allah differentiates in the Quran subhanAllah between the believers as well and you've got to understand one thing is that when Allah says mu'min when Allah says believer he follows it straight away with action whenever Allah calls us as believers he, he calls us, oh you've believed, you've got to do this. Now, if you do the actions, then fine, you are now someone who deserves what the promises Allah has made in the Quran for the believers. Because you've lived up to your belief. If you don't do what Allah says, so Allah says, oh you believe, do this. Oh you believe, do this. And Allah says in the whole Quran, He says, awfu bi'ahdi. You fulfill this part of the promise, I will fulfill my side of the promise. It's very clear in the Quran. Okay? Now what happens is, if you do fulfill it, and if you do the, do the actions Allah is saying, look man, when Allah's help will come, you'll be one of them who will, reach, who will receive Allah's help. There is no doubt about it. And you will always find Allah's always got a good way out for you, no matter what situation, because Allah said, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا in Surah Talaq, Surah number um, 65, ayah number 2, Allah says, Whosoever is conscious of Allah, Allah will always find a way out for them. Okay? Now, if you're one of those believers who's doing their best to try and, you know, stick to their religion, then fine. Don't worry about things. Just depend on Allah. Do the best you can. And you will find the help of Allah will be with you, with your close ones and so on, when the, when the time arises. However, if you really look at the Quran and the way Allah has told us who the believers are, because there's a difference between you saying, oh yeah, we've got, what would we say? We've got 1.6 billion Muslims on the earth. 1.7 billion Muslims on the earth. How comes Zaki we like this? Well, my friend, when you made that statement, 1.7 billion Muslims on the earth, you've got to realize from the 1.7 billion, Possibly, I don't know, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4 of those billions are probably people who are very, very far off the deen, very far. They probably don't even have proper faith inside them. I don't know how many. I'm just taking a wild guess. There's probably almost a billion, if you want to put it that way, there are Muslims out there, you know, with Muslim names, with Muslim family names, with probably Allahu in the cars, okay, hanging out down, Allahu on a chain, and Allahu on a ring, or Ayatul Kursi somewhere, in the business, the, all that, you know, the big, big, you know, Hamim, you know, something else, you know, mashallah, big board in their business. And if you go into the house, you find Qulad Rabbi Nas, Qulad Rabbi Falak, and all that, they've got the few artifacts, fine. But guess what? They haven't, got, they haven't got any of the actions of the believers. They, some of these people, they lie, they cheat, they swear, they, they're abusive, they break many laws of the Quran, they're dealing with riba and usury every single day, whichever way it is, they don't pray, they don't fast, or they do fast now and again, they do pray now and again, something, Ramadan comes, they'll pray for the first two, three nights, it's exciting, then after that it's too tiring, then they'll get back up again, 27th night, oh my God, I can't miss this night, so they'll pray, then they'll go back down again, Eid day comes, okay, let me come out with my nice clothes on, and eat as much as I can, and then sit down again till the next Eid, and then maybe, you know, something else might come up, <clears throat> Muharram or some, you know, Ashura, maybe even 12th Rabiul Awal, everyone's out there celebrating something about the Prophet. Let me just go out there and do that. And that's it. Then another Ramadan comes and they're up again for two, three nights or whatever. And that's how their lives are going. You've got to understand they don't fit in the definition of Allah's definition about a believer. They don't. I'm sorry. You can almost say about a billion of them out there are probably like that. I'm sorry to put it like that. There are, there are many. I don't know. It could be 0.7 of the billion. It could be 0.5 of the billion. I don't know. But I'm saying it's a very large portion. Okay? Very large portion. And then, 
out of the 1.7 you know billion you've probably already lost with my calculation you probably left with about half a billion okay out of them out of the half a billion you've got them who are trying okay they're trying to practice okay so they might have gone for Umrah. I, I've seen a lot of these Muslims, they'll go for Umrah. They love it. Oh, mashallah, they come back. Oh, I got this miswag. I got the tasbis. I'm going to pray now. You know, the guy probably got a bit of stubble growing, which is really good. Sister's got a bit of a hijab and they're talking fantastic, Kaaba, this and that, okay? But after two weeks, two months, gone. Gone. And then they'll say, oh, I need to look forward for my next Umrah, my next, you know, whatever. Then they'll go after a year, two years. They'll come back a bit, a bit hyped up. And if they do this two, three times, then they go over there and they don't feel anything because they just haven't built up any spirituality. They just haven't even discovered that side. It's, it was just outside artifacts, Kaaba, you know, um, being there with a lot of Muslims, feeling hyped up. Um, and that's all it was, really. I'm sorry, but you've got a portion of them like that. Then you've got others who, mashallah, they do practice. But they practice for about one, one year, six months, two years, and they're out again. Then you've got those people who practice, mashallah, they're practicing, mashallah. So on the outskirts of it, you think, mashallah, the brothers, you know, he's doing his salah and so on. But the guy, you think, la ilaha illallah, his tongue, his anger, his problem with how he talks to people or his akhlaq and his character, oh my God, it's, it's, it's crazy. He backbites people, he stirs amongst people. I'm talking about real people I've observed. Guys, I'm not talking about a comic book, okay? I'm talking about real people. As an imam, I've had to deal with these people. The guy prays five times a day, never miss it. He'll never miss it. SubhanAllah, every Ramadan he gives zakat. Every Ramadan he fasts. So he's got a calculating date in Ramadan, he gives it every year. Whole Ram Ramadan he'll fast. And he sends loads of sadaqah as well. But you know what? The guy is abusive. The guy will backstab you. The guy will, uh, is very politically, you know, he, he, he stirs between people. He will make this one fight with that one, that one fight with that one. I know why, because I was part of this. He just stirred me with some others. I was like, Ya Allah. Seriously, Ya Allah, what is this guy doing? And I'm talking about some close people who pray five times a day, who will never miss prayers, who are like this. And when you come across them, you think, whoa, you know, why is this? I had once, subhanAllah, I, I, I'll tell you this, right? You know, you can't measure everyone with the same yardstick, okay? I had two sets of builders once come to my house, two sets of builders. The first main builder who's managing all the other builders, the first one, he says, Akhi, Sheikh, when you're going to pray Salah, please tell me. Please tell me. I want to join you in Salah. Wow. You're like, man, this guy's, this guy's on it, yeah? <laughs> so when I'm praying, I say, brother, I'm playing two minutes quickly. I'll do my wudu. I come. He comes. I think, subhanAllah, builder. He's managing all the other builders. He wants to pray with me. He prays with me. Salat al in my house. Doesn't miss Asr. Doesn't miss Zohar. Whenever he's around. Doesn't miss Maghrib. SubhanAllah. And sometimes we sit down at eating lunch or something or eating a dinner and I buy some food and I'm sitting with him and I tell him a hadith and he cries. A hadith, I told him, a normal hadith. And the guy, he cries, goes, oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> so Christ. Right? Okay, he's the first one, okay? The guy doesn't have a beard, fine, but the guy prays with me, he doesn't miss a prayer. And when he hears a hadith, he cries. And everything else, Allah, everything, you know, he, I'm going to Hajj. He says, look, take this 300. Give it to any, any poor person in Makkah. Just give it to them. I thought, subhanAllah, the guy's giving extra sadaqah to people in Makkah. I said, fine, I'll deliver it for you, right? I personally delivered that, okay? The second guy, salah time comes. This, this new builder, okay? So this other guy had gone and new builder came, okay? The second builder, he sees me praying. He don't pray. Juma time. No Juma. Okay? He don't pray with me. If I say hadith to him, he says, okay, he respects it, but he doesn't cry like the first one. He's not affected like the first one. Okay, fine. Okay, but he's just a normal, you know, just normal things to talk about. But he's not into prayer. He's got, he's got no beard as well. He's not into the Jummas, nothing. You know, he's, the first one, Juma. oh my God, he'll never miss. Okay? Now listen to what happens. The first one, later on, when he gets, you know, used to it, used to everything, and he's got enough money, he starts swearing, starts shouting, 
starts being abusive to me, to my family members. Right? Starts saying, I'm going to leave this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. He starts, he starts causing damage. Purposefully, he leaves pipes that are loose. So that, you know, when he, he'll cover everything up. He'll say, everything's fine. You turn the tap on, forget the tap. You know what he left loose in my house? He left the toilet loose. So when you actually do a poo, yeah, you can smell it from downstairs. Purposefully, now I'm not talking purposely, left sink things, you know, underneath the sink, something like that, on purpose. Why? Because he's got a grudge against you or he doesn't feel this or that. And he was very nasty. In fact, he ripped me off 15,000 pounds. The guy was crying and he's, oh, 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 oh. Christ. MashaAllah. Praise Jamaa with me as well. And he, and he they ripped me off 15,000 pounds. The second one, never prays with me, never goes to Jumaa. Okay? Never cried to any hadith I said to him. Fix his my entire house. He does more than what he had to. Muslim guy, okay? More than what he had to. He takes less money. He comes back again and again and fixes things. He doesn't demand over demand anything. He never was abusive, never swore at me, never was you know, insulting to me or my family or anything. And he'd done his job and he's gone nicely. And you think, what? You think, what? This is, this is what you've got to understand that look, just because someone's praying, just because someone's practicing, you've got to understand not everyone's equal. There are people who pray amongst us who are some of the closest to Allah. And some people pray amongst us, they come to the masjid to steal. You ever, anybody ever had their shoes stolen from a masjid? Put your hands up. Am I the only one here? Yeah, am I the only one? Yeah. It's not any non-Muslims coming and stealing, bruv. It's Muslims, okay? Some of them who got a Muslim name, a Muslim outside, you know, brown skin, you know, rest of the sheep, they won't be seeing anything. They'll come inside, they'll, they'll look for shoes, they'll steal it, they'll go. Or coat pockets. I mean, how many times in the masjid, people's coat pockets? You know, people come to the masjid, you take your coat off, you leave it, you go for wudu. You think, this is masjid, right? Who's going to steal from the masjid? Next minute you come here, you know, your things are gone. Sometimes your whole coat is gone. <laughs> ya Allah. <laughs> your whole coat is gone. Ya Allah. And this happens. But I'm not going to say all Muslims are like this. Because there are many Muslims who, you leave your wallet somewhere. You leave your left wallet, you're watching the wudu area. You left something very valuable. And someone saw it, they'll bring it and they'll announce it. Or they'll come to the committee, they'll say, look, has anyone... You know, it happens many times, right? They'll say, has anyone left a wallet? Not a single thing is missing. Not a pound is missing, not a credit card is missing, nothing. They've just given to you as, as they found it. And on top of that, they don't want any thanks or something. There are many Muslims like that. Okay? Now, my point to you is, subhanAllah, when you look at the 1.7 billion, you come down to the last, you know, couple of billion. I think if, I think the, the really good practice in Muslims, you know, from the, let's say if it was even half a billion, I'd say like 0.4 of that billion again are these people who practice, but they don't practice properly. As in, their heart's still not in the right, right place. They haven't really transformed properly. They might have even kept the beards. They might have even worn the hijab, but they still haven't got the heart in the right place. They might not have a beard. They might not have a... It's got nothing to do with the beard. I'm, I'm being honest with you. Beard is important, fine. If you want to follow the Prophet, I'm fine, yes. But I'm not going to ever judge a Muslim by his beard or judge a Muslim by her hijab. There are certain Muslim women I know will never touch a man. Never touch a man or allow a man to touch her. But she's got no hijab on her head. She walks every day out there without a hijab on her head. I've met these Muslim women. Never allow any man to touch them. And there are certain Muslim women who hijab, mashallah, they walk out, you know, you think sister, she's always looking down. Gone to the bus, slowly hijab comes off, you know, convertible one, you know what I'm saying, like, yeah? Convertible one, BMW, press the, you know, press the button, it comes off, yeah? You know, this comes off, then the makeup comes on. By the time they're going to college, yeah, full, you know, in the, in the, in the um, uh, restroom, they'll go there, they'll pull the makeup on, and the whole day they spend, you know, with non-hijab and makeup and everything. And then, end of the day, they'll come back to the restroom, wash it all off, you know, put it all on, go back to the bus. By that time, it's converted back again. Yeah, looking down again, come in the house. Oh, mashallah, my daughter, mashallah. And I know these sisters because these sisters have made it very clear what they're up to. Or other sisters have made it very clear of what they're up to. Now, I'm not going to say all hijabi sisters are like that. I'm not going to say all non-hijabi sisters are like that. My point is, don't judge people just by what they've got on the outside. If you really want to judge believers, then yes, I'm going to give you, you know, when you look at the Quran, 
you look at the definition of the Quran gives about believers, you'll find there's a, there's a whole new world out here. It's not about a few beliefs, it's not about how practicing the brother, or sorry, how, how outwardly practicing someone is, or how much knowledge they have. See, some people they think, wow, that guy knows so much about Islam. He must be someone close to Allah. It doesn't mean anything. You can know, I mean, you know, they say, subhanAllah, they say, you know who the biggest scholar is today in the world? Biggest Islamic scholar. You know who the biggest Islamic scholar is today in the world? Biggest, biggest Islamic scholar in the world. Anyone? Biggest, the greatest Islamic scholar in the world right now who knows everything, Quran, Sunnah to the bottom, who knows it inside out. You know who? Shaitan. <laughs> Shaitan. You think of Iblis? Honestly, Iblis. He sat, he watched Nuh alayhi salam. Iblis watched Hud alayhi salam, Salih alayhi salam. Iblis watched Ibrahim alayhi salam. He spent a life watching him, trying to do something about his mission. He watched Ismail alayhi salam, Ishaq alayhi salam, Yusuf alayhi salam. Iblis was the one that made Yusuf and brothers go against him and leave him in the well. Allah says, Inna shaitan Iblis was there. He knew Yusuf alayhi salam's good words. He know, knew all of that. Isa alayhi salam, Yahya alayhi salam, Zakaria alayhi salam, all the prophets. Then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. You think Iblis didn't know about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam? You think he don't know about this hadith and the Quran? He knows the Quran inside out. Big time. And he knows the hadith as well. But he's the biggest scholar, but that doesn't make him, you know, the close one to Allah. Okay, so knowledge is important, but if you look at it from that side, you know, it's, it's not the only thing that will get you salvation. Okay, so what does Allah Azza wa say? So I'm going to quote you some verses very quickly, and I want you to understand that this will give an overall rounded um, thing about the, about the believers. Okay, so... Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 208. Allah says, Ya kafa. O you who believe, enter Islam fully. Allah is telling the believers, enter fully. Get better and better as Muslims. Okay, another one. Allah says, Surah number 3, Ayah number 200. Ya amanu sbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu. O you who believe, have patience and join in each other. Make others patient with you as well. Okay. وَرَابِتُ And also look after the Muslims and guard them, protect them. This is part of Iman, that you have to have patience. Okay. Another one, Surah number 4, Ayah number 59. يَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You believe. أَطِيعُ الله, Obey Allah. وَأَطِيعُ Rasul, Obey His Messenger. These are specific commands that distinguish you from all the munafiqs, all the hypocrites, all the weak believers, all the believers by their name as believers, all the ones that practice a little, they distinguish you because you're always trying to obey Allah's Messenger. Surah number 9, ayah number 119. Ya amanu, O you who believe, ittaqullah, be aware of Allah. Wa kunu and remain amongst the truthful ones. Okay, don't stay amongst liars. If you find someone lying again and again, just leave him, leave his, leave his side. Okay. Another one, Surah number 24, Ayah number 21. Ya ayyu alladhina amanu, O you who believe, la tattabi'u khutuwati shaitan. Don't follow the footsteps of the shaitan. So be aware that you've got an enemy and you should not follow him. Okay, another verse I'll give you. Surah number 62, Ayah number 9. Ya ayyu alladhina amanu. So let me start with a different verse first, so we go in order. Ya ayyu alladhina amanu, O you who believe. Okay, this is Surah number 22, Ayah number 77. Irka'u, bow down, usjudu, prostrate, wakunu ma'ar raki'een, and, uh, and, and be amongst those people, be amongst those people who, wa'abudu uh, rabbakum, and worship your Lord. Allah Azza wa Jal says in another part, He says, kunu, you know, warka'u ma'ar raki'een, be amongst those people who bow down, meaning that join your prayers. Allah says in Surah number, Surah number 5, Ayah number 6, Ya ayu alladhina amanu, O you believe, when you stand up for prayers, wash your faces, wash your arms, meaning do wudu. This is all practical stuff. Oh, you believe? Okay, you can do wudu. You believe? You start praying. Okay, you believe? You do this. Allah says, Surah number 2, Ayah number 183. Ya amanu, O you who believe, kutiba alaykum siyam. There's fasting that has been prescribed upon you, which you have to do just like the people before you. Okay, another verse. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. This is Surah number 62, Ayah number 9. إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ When Adhan is said for the Jummah prayers, then rush 
be, you know, be hasty to get to, to, to join the salah. This is in surah number 62, ayah number 9. Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, surah number 66, ayah number 6. Ya ayu alladheena amanu, O you believe, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and save your families from the fire. Now you've got a responsibility not just to save yourself, save your families as well. So they've got a good you know, attitude towards the family as well. Allah says when you're in a gathering, Ya ladina amanu idha qila lakum tafassahu. You're in a gathering, you believers. When you have to make space in a gathering, make space for others. When you have to stand up and let others sit down, then do that. This is, this is part of your, your etiquette that you've got in a gathering. This was surah number... Surah number 58, ayah number 11. In another one, Allah says, Surah number 49, ayah number 11, Allah says, O you who believe, la yasqar qawmun min qawm. You will never have racism between yourselves. This is, this is about believers. O you believe, no racism amongst yourselves. Surah 49, ayah 11, Allah says, uh, says that. And then in same surah, ayah number 6, Allah says, investigate. You have bad news coming to you, investigate about the news before you afflict someone about it. Surah number 24, ayah number 27, Allah says, Ya ayu alladhina amanu la tadkhulu buyutan ghayra buyutikum. You've got social etiquettes amongst yourself. Don't enter anyone's house. Make sure that you enter with permission. Okay? These are all social adabs and social etiquettes we've got. Allah says in surah number 2, ayah number 172, Ya ayu alladhina amanu, o you, o you who believe, kulu min tayyibati ma razaqnakum. Eat from the good that we've given to you. From the good that we've given to you. I mean, you know, there's people out there not caring about what they're even eating. Oh, you know, anything, anything is goes. Try and even justify it with whatever you can find, okay? Surah number 2, ayah number 254, Allah says, Ya ayu alladhina amanu anfiqu, o you believe, spend. Spend what we've, from what we've given to you. Give sadaqah to others and give charity to others. Then Allah says, Surah number 2, ayah number 264. Ya ayu al amanu, O you who believe, la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha. You spend on someone, don't boast your favors on them. Don't belittle them because you gave them some money. Treat them nicely. Just because you've got money, they haven't got money, you gave them money, don't boast your favors on them and say, yeah, I helped you out. I did this for you in the past. Okay? Surah number 2, ayah number 278. Allah says, Ya ayu al amanu, O you who believe. ذَرُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ riba. Stay away from usury and interest. In your dealings, you have to be clean. Allah says, Surah number 5, Ayah number 90, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْ يُهُ بِلِيبِ إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِتْسٌ مِنْ عَمْلِ الشَّيْطَانِ You أَوْ يُهُ بِلِيبِ Gambling, intoxicants, all these things, stay away from them. Stay away from them because the shaitan involves himself in them. So Allah is telling us how believers should be upright in, in the in the way they have their you know, financial dealings. Allah says in the Holy Quran, Surah number 4, Ayah number 29, Ya ayu alladheena amanu, O you who believe, La ta'kulu amwalakum baynakum bil batil. Don't consume one another's wealth in a way that is unlawful. Don't cheat one another. Be careful in how you have your dealings you know, with one another. Surah number... <coughs> Surah number... Five, ayah number eight, Allah says, Ya ayu alladheena amanu, O you who believe, kunu qawwamina lillahi shuhada'a bil qist. Be upright when it comes to giving witnesses. Don't give false, false witnesses. Surah number 33, ayah number 41, Ya ayu alladheena amanu, dhkurullaha dhikran kathira. O you who believe, remember Allah abundantly, plentifully. Try and remember more and more. Surah number 49, ayah number 12, Ya ayu alladheena amanu, O you who believe, ijtanibu kathira min adhwan. Don't be suspicious. Don't be people who are suspicious of one another and start backbiting one another. Surah number, five, uh, surah number 58, ayah number, um, ayah number 9, O oh, you who believe, don't whisper amongst yourselves to try and create a situation with other believers where they don't know what you're talking about. Okay? They don't know, but you might be talking about something that is sinful. Allah says, Surah number 59, ayah number 18, Ya ayu alladheena amanu, O you who believe, think about what you've sent for the, for the next day, for tomorrow, for the akhirah. Okay? I'll spend another about five minutes and I'll be done with you, inshallah. Surah number 61, ayah number 10, Allah says, Ya ayu alladheena amanu, O you who believe, hala adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min a'adhaabin alim. Should I tell you about a dealing you can do with, with you know, a, a dealing you can do that will save you from the punishment of the next life? 
and Allah encourages us to be, you know, to strive in His pathway, to sacrifice our wealth, to sacrifice ourselves. If you look at those, that ayah, you'll find that there. Surah number, Surah number 63, ayah number 9. Allah says, Ya ayyu alladheena amanu o you who believe, la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikrillah. Don't allow your, your own children and your wealth to distract you from my remembrance. Okay, so these are now, you can see, look, can you see from the first verses I said, to these verses, they're now getting more and more closer to Allah. These are top qualities that the believers will display. Surah number 66, ayah number 8. Ya ayyu alladheena amanu o you who believe, tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. Repent to Allah, a clear repentance. And then Allah says on the day of judgment, I will help you if you, if you do this later on in the verse. Surah number 3, ayah number 118. Ya amanu, O you who believe, you know, don't give away your secret things to those people who may harm you. Like, be, be loyal to the believers. Okay? Surah number... Surah number... 19 Surah number sorry let me another one. Now, now you will see the Nusra or right, now you'll see the, these verses now will tell you now now this is the crux of the whole of the talk now if you've been doing all of these things which Allah has told us to do okay as believers the just the verses I've quoted and many other verses I'm, I've just given you a taster of it if you do this now listen to what Allah has promised these believers from the Quran okay Surah number 13, ayah number 31. Um, Allah says, I will guide you. Don't have, don't have, ho- don't be hopeless of me. Surah number 18, ayah number 13, Allah says, Innahum fityatun amanu bi rabbihim wa zidnahum huda. There were a few group of young people who believed in me and I increased them in faith. Surah number 19, ayah number 96, Allah says, Inna alladheena amanu, those who believed like this, all these things that I've said, they've done good actions. Allah will show them a very close form of love. Very close form of love. Surah number 21, ayah number 38. Allah will defend the believers. Now which believers are Allah talking about? These believers or 1.7 billion? Huh? Which one? Go and tell me. 1.7 billion or just these ones? These ones, I don't know how many there are in the world, but these are the ones Allah, was, Allah will give His help eventually. And He will always you know, show His close mercy to them and His love to them. Surah number 22, ayah number 54. Inna Allah lahadi alladheena amanu ila siratin mustaqim. Allah will guide those who believe to the straight path. These are the believers Allah will keep close to Him. Surah number, <clears throat> surah number 2, ayah number 257. Allahu waliyyul ladheena amanu yukhrijuhum min al-zulumat ila nur Allah is the guardian of the believers he will take them out of darkness and he will put them into light okay surah number <coughs> surah number um, 57 ayah number 16 let me leave you with this verse inshallah and then I'll summarize the whole of the talk and then we we'll finish inshallah surah number 57 ayah number 16 Allah says alam ya'ni lil ladina amanu an tahsha qulubuhum li dhikrillahi wa ma nazala min al haqq hasn't the time drawn near for the believers for the hearts to become soft and devoted towards the remembrance of Allah and towards the revelation Allah has given to you hasn't the time come that your hearts should soften to all of this now subhanallah alazim Allah says this one, you know, really important ayah, surah number 40, ayah number 51, Allah says, Inna lanansuru rusulana walladheena amanu fil hayati dunya. I will definitely help my messengers and I will help the believers on the earth. Allah said this. Now, many Muslims today ask the question, why isn't Allah's help coming? Why are we in this situation? Well, you want to know why? Well, if you listen to my whole thing, is because first, don't create this black and white world, number one. Second, don't think all the people who are disbelievers are all the same, okay? And also don't think all the believers are all the same because we're all got various levels. And when it comes to the believers, we've got a lot of believers fine today with by name, but not everyone is living up to what the Quran, what Allah has defined as believers according to the Quran. And you know what? When you really think about it, you think, subhanAllah, no wonder. No wonder Allah has not given that victory to all those 1.7 billion. You know why? Because many of the 1.7 billion already 
are drinking or they're gambling or they're playing horse racing okay or they've got horses their own you know some of the rich arabs you know yalla they got they own the horses million pound horses okay or they are cheating or they're trying to cheat people on 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 ebay or they're trying to cheat people on online transactions or they're trying to cheat you know or they're trying to be abusive to their family members or neglectful of their duties or they've got bad character or they're lying or cheating or they couldn't care less about who they've mugged because they just want money for themselves or they want you know they'll they'll even dishonor a a, a woman for her dignity because no one was watching them whatever the case is or they're sitting there privately watching things on their screens which is haram and listen to things in their ears which is haram in the clubs and the you know whatever you know uh, places they've got where they're dancing and dining and they're clubbing and dating and whatever else it is but you know what they've got a muslim name they're muslims if they're already doing that before the victory what do you think they're going to do after the victory if allah says today okay I will give all the Muslims in the world right now, today, and today, all of the victory, all the country's victory. What's going to happen? They'll be ten times worse. And Allah's waiting for whatever reason it is so that the time can come where He can give the Nusra and the help to the right believers. And Allah's going to create the right situation, the right moment for that, however He does it. So, as fellow Muslim brothers, and believers, may Allah Azza wa Jal give us thabat and give us stability in this religion. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us understanding of the Quran properly. May Allah give us a, give us a balance to understand the Quran. And may Allah Azza wa Jal give us you know, patience in these times. And may Allah give us clear understanding of why Allah decides not to act right now. And it should be clear from this talk that is because there's a lot more going on than the black and white you know, picture that people point out. I hope that will benefit for you, Zakim Allah Khair. And I'm going to open up to any questions that you got. Yes. By the way, before we end, sorry, before we end today, um, we're going to have a few weeks of a break because the holidays is here. Um, and I've got the kids on holiday. And also, I might be traveling abroad as well. So let me give you the date when we're going to start back again. It's going to be a bit of a break, so we're going to start back again mid-Jan. So that's going to be 18th, 18, 18th Jan, because I'm going, to, I'm going to be traveling as well as the, the holiday. So 18th Jan, if you want to please put that in your diaries right now, 18th January, we're going to be starting on that date. And I should have a series, you know, a, a proper series then running from then. Um, on so 18th of January we'll start a, a, a new series inshallah whatever series this is for the last few weeks we've been having these one-off talks so this will be the last one of talk and from 18th of January inshallah I'll have a series running and I'll give you the update of that um, if um, Akram do you have any emails with you that you collected over the times yep if anyone hasn't registered the email yet put your hand up Akram so please register email today with him and he will send the emails out before the 18th of Jan as a reminder of when the class is starting. But in the masjid as well, I'll get the imam to make the announce, announcement as well. So we'll have the questions now, inshallah. Inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Yes, yes. Their brothers asking for us to make a dua for the people around the world, inshallah, especially for people in uh, Halab or Aleppo at this moment. Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, relieve them from the zulm and the oppression that they, that they, I believe, in brothers and sisters are going through at this moment. Amen. Inshallah. We may, we'll make a dua, inshallah, for, for that. Yes, well, yes, brother. Sorry? Yeah, yeah.
So what, when you mention about the heat of Kurbani, it is justified that the great Kurbani is in that state of being, or is it a psychology that the person says, I'm doing Kurbani, not the intention of what was the Kurbani done. I, can anyone just tell me his actual question? The actual question is <coughs> I don't understand yet. whether he testifies the way of doing, using the meat, the fetta. Fetta means meat. Okay, for, for a particular occasion of a khatam or something, not because, it, not because it's Eid, it's not Eid. So the thing is, the Qurbani, when we say the Qurbani of Uduhiya, it's to do with the Eid al-Adha. So you're not talking about Eid one, right? No. You're not talking about Eid one, you're talking about another one. Yeah. Okay, so, so look, it depends on the function they're doing. If, they, if they're actually sacrificing an animal because of the wedding or because of some yeah. other occasion. For that. Well, the thing is, look, once you've got Qurbani done, then the meat can be uh, given to your own family members. If you want to have it... Look, what I'm saying is, if you want to eat it as your families, you can. If you want to eat it as your friends, you can. And if you want to all agree together, say, look, we've done the qurbani. Let's store the meat for the wedding that's coming up. You can do it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. There's not a specific thing that you must... You know, obviously, you have to give to the poor people as well. But there's no specific thing that you must eat it at that time or something. You can store the meat and you can use it for other functions. That's fine. As long as people agree. But if it's, if it's something where people need the meat at Eid time, then you should give it to them. Because that's the whole point, one of the points that we sacrifice it for. What I was saying is, the third function is going to the family. The yeah, yeah, so it's up to them. They can, if, if it's their sacrifice and it's their family, they can decide what they want to do with it. That's fine, that's up to them. They, they can decide, they can decide what they want to do. I'm going to move on because we're quite late today. No, 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 no. Let, let, me, let, me, um, let me go to somebody else because I know there's a number of people waiting, inshallah, sorry. Okay. Okay. So what 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 the brother is asking for the sister's sake is that you know Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu and also Hamzala in one case um, at certain occasions questioned themselves whether they were munafiqs or not, whether they were hypocrites or not. So the brother is asking what is the actual specific understanding of this. So the hadith goes where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi is not seeing Hamzala in his gathering for a while. He inquires about him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu he he you know volunteers to go and find him. He finds, Abu Bakr goes and finds him, radiallahu anhu, and Hamdullah says, I've become a hypocrite. And Abu Bakr says, why? So Hamdullah says, when we, are, when we are with, Hamdullah radiallahu anhu, he says that when we are with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he speaks to us about Jannah and Jahannam, it, it feels like Jannah and Jahannam are right in front of us. But when we go back to our families and we enjoy ourselves in the, you know, the normal family life, then that whole thing disappears. Okay? So I'm feeling like I'm a hypocrite because you should have stayed the same way we felt in the Prophet's gathering, we should have felt at home as well. So because of that lack of, you know, um, the, the lack of feelings that we've had in the two gatherings, they questioned themselves. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wept with Hamdullah radiallahu anhu and both of them came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and both said we become hypocrites. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa explained, he said, this is gone, you know, in, in more or less rounded words, he said to them that this is not hypocrisy. He said, These are, this is natural. For you to feel like this in my gathering will be natural. And when you go home, then you will have a different situation. And he said, Sa'atan fa sa'atan. He said, one moment you will have to be in this case. One moment you will have to be in that case. And he said, if you had been in the same situation and the same state as you find yourselves in my gathering, then the angels will never have left you alone. They would have been with you on the street side. They would have been with you. Um, even when you go to bed as well, I mean, you'd be in a different state altogether. But because we're human beings, we have to have these differences in our states of heart. Now, this was a question they had about themselves. And even Umar, he was very harsh on himself to say, have I got hypocrisy? And clearly he didn't have hypocrisy. It was, it was 
people trying to be very cautious, over cautious about themselves to make sure that they don't have an ounce of that inside their lives. So one of the famous ones is when um, uh, Umar radiallahu anhu asks one of the Sahaba, sahaba radiallahu anhu admain, Huzaifa, who was known as the person who kept the secret of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Huzaifa was told about the three hundred plus munafiqs of Medina, and Umar said to him, he said, "I'm not going to ask you to reveal." to me the, the whole list, but I'm going to ask you whether my name is on that list. And he said, no, it's not on that. And he was happy with that. So it clearly shows that he wasn't a hypocrite. But all of this was so that they, they were overly harsh on themselves to make sure that they're not falling short in anything. That's what it was. Okay. Any any other person that's got a, somebody had a question on the, around here now? Just, just one minute. Anyone on, has got any other question now? Is your question to do with Qurbani again or something else? Yeah, Qurbani, if it's then I'll take it privately after this gathering, inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah, inshallah. Uh, brother, and that's it, yeah. dua and then yeah. inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. I'll see you 18th of January, inshallah. Please put that in your diary. Jazakumullah khair. Yeah. والرسمات هنا سرور يا حلوات الكاسن The Safar curriculum covers all the Islamic educational needs of young Muslims today in a fun, simple and engaging way. Tried and tested for over 15 years at one of the UK's leading maktabs. The curriculum has been adopted by hundreds of institutions around the world and makes your child's journey in seeking knowledge easy, meaningful and dynamic. This innovative and comprehensive curriculum covers Quran and Tajweed, Islamic studies, du'as and surahs, as well as Arabic in an integrated and structured way. Visit safarpublications.org to find out more.